Good afternoon, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Achit, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we're joined by Dr. Clint Stevens, who will be sharing his experience using CAD CAM and how it has given him control over his patient experiences and outcomes, as well as practice efficiency and profitability. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A section, and we'll answer them at the end. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Stevens, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate everybody showing up uh, to the end of what for me at least was a long day. Hopefully you had a better day than I did, but uh, uh, excited to share with you a little bit about in office CAD CAM and, and how to help transform your patient experience here. I guess the first question is always um, then, um, you know, why are you thinking to digitize? I know that there are a lot of reasons potentially that you're thinking about it today. And obviously you came to a webinar on in-office CAD CAM. You notice I'm using the term in-office CAD CAM, not necessarily chair-side CAD CAM, because we've got a lot of things that are changing these days. So first of all, I'd love to share with you why I went digital 15 years ago. Now, you might not, feel that this is particularly relevant to you or your situation. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it's not, though, is I talk about a few things. I think uh, we're going to find a lot of common ground, even if my primary motivating factor when I went digital 15 years ago doesn't seem to be yours. Uh, actually, it is. And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. You know, I decided to get an insurance CAD camp back when Really, the only thing a chairside CAD CAM system did was create a restoration that could be delivered in a same day format. And really, the reason I got into that was because in my daily practice, I found that that most of what I did in my practice had to do with fixing a single tooth. So, for example, these teeth, this is what I saw in my practice most of the time. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't what I got to deal with today. It was a lot of surgery today, but uh, this is predominantly what my practice sees. And I was looking for a way to fix these teeth. Ironically, Cheerside CAD CAM was developed by our European colleagues in the early 80s to, to address specifically these problems. As you probably know, they were already much more hesitant to use dental amalgam in their practices than we were on the US side and they were looking for an alternative to resin composite or crowns. Resin, because at the time in the early 80s, late 70s was, was not a great technology and crowns because they were looking for a more conservative way to treat teeth. And so they decided to leverage an emerging technology in other fields, which was that of CAD CAM as in computer aided uh, design and, and manufacturing to try to solve these problems with a ceramic. And, and this is exactly why I got an insurance CAD CAM, so that I could treat these teeth in my practice in such a way that was aesthetic, conservative, and long lasting. And, and for me, this was a paradigm shift in my practice. Uh, speaking of my practice, before I go any further, probably need a few disclosures. Uh, I trained at San Antonio and did an AGD at the University of Michigan. I have several um, relationships with various manufacturers. Unfortunately, I don't uh, play with a lot of free stuff. I pay to play, uh, but, I, but I have worked with these manufacturers in the past, just so that you're aware of those relationships. My email address, that's my personal email address. And yes, I still have a Hotmail account because I'm old enough to have an OG account feel free to shoot me an email with comments, questions, uh, et cetera. And I'm happy to, to take those. This is my family. My wife is also a dentist and does not practice in my practice. Uh, that maintains a very happy household. Uh, my son is now 12 and a guitar player and a soccer player. So I spent a lot of my time chasing him around. And Johnny is our rescue pity. Um, so we have a, a nice family. I practice in downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
in a bread and butter PPO driven practice. So I am a GP that spends my days fixing broken teeth for not a whole lot of money. So that's, that's my life. And I'm also excited to say that I joined the Mott Institute in Charleston, South Carolina as an instructor and specifically I teach a course about partial coverage with glass ceramics at that institute. If you really want to deep dive on some of the things that I'm really not going to have time to touch on today, I'd invite you to come join us there and, and go. We have some great hands-on education there. Really, though, the, the fact is, is that we've had a big evolution in digital dentistry. When it, so when I started digitizing my practice with Chairside CAD CAM over 15 years ago now, there was a big difference then as to what that meant. That really meant that I had a system where I had a scanner and I had a mill, but that was about it. And really the truth is today, digital dentistry is much different than it was a decade or two ago. And so we really need to change our perspective about what it means when we talk about digital technologies in dentistry. Because as I mentioned, uh, for a long time, we were just having replacement solutions for what we did. It really didn't change uh, what we were trying to do or, or why we did it. We were, we were basically just, for example, with CAD CAM dentistry, taking the triple tray and converting it into a scanner and a mill. And, and in fact, we weren't even very, doing a very good job of that. As, as you notice, I was a big fan of partial coverage with glass ceramics, and now I still am. That's the bread and butter lion's share of my practice. But if you didn't subscribe to that type of treatment, whether it be partial coverage or those types of materials, Cheerside CAD CAM 10 or 15 years ago was not an option for you, right? Because it forced you to change the way you did things, uh, not only with respect to workflow, but with armamentarium, uh, material choices, uh, preparations, a whole host of things that, that really made that transition difficult, especially if you didn't subscribe to all of those changes. Well, welcome to 2022. So, so now things are very different. Right, we're no longer just taking phosphor plates or a sensor and replacing intraoral films. We're no longer just taking um, a scanner and replacing a triple tray, but but we're creating new ways to do things that are opening up possibilities with with digital technologies that up until now have actually not been accessible to us as providers. And along with that, we're expanding the capabilities of both imaging and manufacturing to where these days now, everything's a possibility. So, so whatever type of dentistry you're doing today, you can do it better via a digital workflow. And because of that, then you can do a better job for your patient who at the end of the day should always be the primary motivating factor for, for why we change things, right? So I'd like to say that there are really three significant changes that have driven this uh, uh, drastic flip here to where we've taken a niche technology for, for very specific things. And now, now in digitizing everything, we're, we're reaching new heights here. And, and it's really for three reasons. And the first reason is because via digital data, we are now able to provide better diagnostics and better solutions for patients. And in this sense, I really am just talking about the capture of digital data. So whether we're talking about uh, CBCT or whether we're talking about using an intral scanner to capture data, in any of those situations, then we're getting better opportunities to serve patients. And oftentimes now, up until now, the digitization of your practice has maybe been an option. Today, I would say, for example, if you're asking, well, does my practice need a digital scanner? 
I have no hesitation in telling you yes. And this goes well beyond just bread and butter dentistry, but let's start there. So we've known for a long time now, long time, meaning that we've had systematic reviews with meta-analyses for over half a decade now. Basically, that means uh, with when these reviews were published, uh, this data would have been older than that. So we're going on data that's already, let's say, a decade or more old, showing that outcomes for what most of us at least statistically do. I, I don't know what you do in your practice, but statistically speaking in a practice like mine, most of what we do is fix a single tooth at a time, right? And the vast majority of uh, us, at least in the United States, uh, do that with indirect fixed prosthodontics. And we've known now, so this data is based it's over a year old, or sorry, over a decade old. So this means that the technologies that were being used at this time to generate this data are dinosaurs. And I mean, you would never want to use this technology today, given what we have. But even on 10-year-old technologies, we were already generating better outcomes for patients, or at least the equivalent outcomes, uh, if not better, than conventional workflows using a digital scanner in digital pathways to fabricate restorations. So it's already a foregone conclusion that today, if you want the best outcome for your patient, especially if you're, uh, when we talk about manufacturing of patient solutions in a digital workflow, plugging into that with digital data from the get go has some, some big advantages, but really it's not just for crowns anymore. So we're getting more and more data now showing that regardless of what we're doing, digital data on the input end of things before we do diagnosis, treatment planning, or, or design or fabrication is doing better than any of our conventional methods that we've had. And that's true whether we're talking about orthodontics where they're reaching the point where they would say that the digital records are or the new gold standard, or whether we're talking about implant supported uh, restorations and these sorts of things. Now, there's some caveats there in that not all digital scanners are made the same, okay? And so we can't make a blanket generalization that no matter what you buy today, it's gonna be better than PVS. But what we can say is that for a lot of scanners on the market today, uh, we are absolutely creating accuracy that, that reaches or exceeds that of traditional polyvinyl siloxane impressions, even when we start to get to dentate full arch impressions. So this is a huge step in our evolution of being able to acquire data and utilize that data for anything from diagnosis of treatment planning to, to final solutions. And, and the interesting thing is, is that, that when, when you look at that, there are, as I mentioned, multiple scanners on the market that can do this for you today. And so when you start to look at, at trueness, which is a combination of accuracy and precision. So if you're surely, uh, you've seen some buzz about these sorts of things. Accuracy is, is uh, how close it is to reality and precision is its ability to, the scanner's ability to repeat that uh, well. And then trueness is then the combination of accuracy and precision. And so you can see that for a lot of scanners now on the market and this data, anytime you see published data, this is published data, anytime you see published data, it's already out of date, right? Because we have changes in, even in this graph, you can see changes in hardware and changes in software uh, that drive improvements sometimes overnight in an interval scanner. And when you ask, well, where's PVS on this? It's, it's way up here. So for digital scanners today, hey, we've got a lot of scanners that can do the majority of your dentistry with no problem. 
it gets a little nicer when we start talking about fully edentulous cases. And, and because the focus tonight's on chairside CAD CAM and some of those things would go, won't go into that though. I will say that we even have scanners today on the market that can do the capture of fully edentulous arches. Though we still don't have any way to capture functional border molding movements and that sort of thing. So if you're into that sort of thing for your removable, we're still not quite there for that. But as far as the data capture itself for soft tissue and other things, uh, we're, we're pretty much there. And the nice thing about imaging and scanning is that we really have technologies now that are easy to use, that are plug and play. So they're, they're disruptive technologies in that they're plugging you into some other things we're going to talk about that are really important when we start looking at trying to improve patient outcomes and to deal with uh, the ever-evolving situation that we have in our practices, at least if you're in a practice like mine, where we have increasing patient expectations uh, and, and a diminishing amount of time to be able to do things. The great thing about these technologies is that they, they don't have to be disruptive to the practice because we've really reached a, a point of plug and play with this type of technology. The learning curve is short uh, and, and the upside is high, right? So for example, if we talk about digital impressions, one of the great thing about digital impressions today, even as a novice impression maker, is that when we're talking about the bread and butter stuff, which would be quadrant dentistry, you can take and retake that impression much faster than you can a conventional impression. This is true even if you're a, an impression novice. And the nice thing is, too, is that when you screw one up, you don't have to spend another 20 bucks to give it another go. Or depending on what state you live in, if you're allowed to, to allow that impression to be made by an auxiliary, or let's say you have one foot in the room while the auxiliary is taking that impression, you don't have to worry about them throwing 20 bucks down the drain either, right? Because if there's something wrong with the digital impression, you can quickly erase that part of the impression and rescan. That works out great. And you don't have to play the game that, that we've all played if you're my age, which, or, or older for sure, which is that, you know, as soon as I put that image of a PBS impression up, what do you, what do your eyes go to? I mean, most of us have been trained fanatically to check margination. We have to have perfect margins. We have to capture those margins. And so I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of you, when I brought that image up of a PBS impression, immediately fixated on those margins in that flash. Maybe you notice that little tear in the flash there, but, but overall, I think we could agree that hey, there's a, a, a great capture of that margin. And if you're playing the assistants running down the hallway, holding this thing up in the air so that you can look at it and see if you got the margin or not, I think a lot of us would feel at a glance very comfortable with this impression. But the problem is, is that we know from data, so there was an article published oh, three or four years ago now in the Journal of the American Dental Association that said that almost 90% of the impressions sent to a laboratory had at least one uh, major error in it. Uh, and over half of those were on the margin of the impression. We have this perception that PBS impressions are perfect and that we're great at them, but the truth is, is that we're not, right? And so oftentimes what happens, we get so fixated on certain things. And, you know, to be honest, unless you blow this up or you have magnification on, even at two and a half, if you glance, you might miss this. But here's a perfect example of uh, an impression error that now is going to get sent to the lab. The lab's going to manage that. And, and typically they're going to manage that in such a way that they'll knock that off and you're going to have not such a great fitting restoration there, but you're probably not going to know it because when it comes back, you're going to try it in. Everything's going to marginate okay and sit seat firmly, and and you're never going to realize that that error is there until possibly later, depending on what there where that error is, might might 
generate a failure, but but you might not know it for a while, right? The cool thing about digital is now you don't have to worry about any of this because you're going to directly see your work blown up in huge magnification before it ever gets sent off, right? And anything that you're sending to the lab, if you choose not to do Chairside CAD CAM, or if you need some laboratory help in this instance, uh, you can send it to the lab instantaneously. So you don't have to worry about anybody coming to pick up your impression. You don't have to worry about anything getting lost in the mail. You don't have to worry about transit times, right? This data can be sent practically instantaneously to the lab and off they go. And the fact that your laboratory today is managing almost everything they do in a digital workflow, hey, this plugs it right into the workflow to get work going, right? And meanwhile, for me, one of the biggest impacts that I've had on my dentistry is the fact that, you know, rarely are we able to see our dentistry this close up. So this is a, um, a high magnification photograph with a camera of a clinical situation, right? Even if you have two and a half or, or five X mag loops, so you don't get to see things this big. And, and meanwhile, when you scan it in with the digital scanner, you get to see it that big, right? So you get to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And for most people, at least uh, for me and most people I know, hey, the first few times you scan in your preparation, hey, you have some uneasy feelings about how terrible the scanner is because there's no way your dentistry looks that bad, right? <laughs> I mean, you look at it and you're like, man, hey, at two and a half X magnification or three and a half or whatever you're using today, a lot of things can look great that when you blow it up, this big, then you have some surprises. And so the great thing about digital impressions, whether you're going to manufacture that restoration or not, is that you get to see your preparation on the big screen and anticipate things that might cause a problem in the fabrication process, even looking at, say, a proposed restoration and the antagonist and the preparation and a cross-sectional view that is not possible with the conventional workflow unless you're gonna saw some dies in half or whatever. So the cool thing is, is that you really get some great feedback on the quality of your preparation and a, and a potential restoration for that tooth. And you get to fix it before it ever gets fabricated, right? So, so it's easy then to visualize potential problems, go ahead and fix those problems and, and then provide a better data input for the lab or for yourself to fabricate a restoration that, that because you've got better control over what goes in, then you're gonna get a better product out for your patient that's gonna minimize potential complications. And that's really the point is that better data is giving you more control and giving you fewer complications, which if you're a private practitioner like I am, and the, the last thing I want to deal with are complications, right? That's what really burns chair time. Uh, it, it affects your, your relationship with your customers, which are your patients. And, and there's nothing worse than having to manage a complication. The fewer complications I can have, the better my business is and the less stressed I am and, and the happier I am too, not to mention my patients. But so the other thing that has really changed, and so, so I mentioned uh, there's three big changes. The, the first being that the digital data is really giving us better information to make better decisions and provide better outcomes. But, but the second change is that digital has absolutely become the conventional way for manufacturing things in our industry over the last decade. So, you know, should your practice have a mill? Well, I'm not a believer that every practice is the right fit for a mill. I do think that the vast majority of practices can benefit from having milling technology in their office, but then a lot of that has to do with uh, you as a practitioner, your practice, and, and what you want to do with it, right? But 
previously there was a, a perception or understanding that that milling technologies were that the chair side versions of milling technologies weren't up to snuff when compared to laboratory methods of manufacturing things. And then subsequently then uh, it's it sort of gotten pigeonholed as is something that's now yeah, not quite as good, cutting corners, those sorts of things. Hey, while, while early manufacturing technologies were limited in their capacity, I think you need to realize now that, that the landscape has changed. So first of all, you as a practitioner are already milling things and you probably realize that, but you'd be surprised at how many of our colleagues don't actually realize that they're manufacturing things via a milled method. In other words, for example, if you look at a graphic, this one's already out of date. This is uh, products out of Gladwell Laboratories a few years ago, and th these numbers just keep getting bigger. But if if you look at the trends in our profession today, it's almost guaranteed that everybody watching this webinar is using monolithic zirconia in their practice. And if you're using monolithic zirconia in your practice or Laird zirconia or zirconia, whatever, you're using a milled solution, right? In turn, almost all of our patient-specific solutions for implants, whether we're talking about something that comes on a tie base with a hole in it, whether we're talking about a custom abutment and a restoration, really doesn't matter. All of our patient-specific implant solutions are manufactured via milling today. And we even see glass ceramics in laboratory environments can be milled. If they're not being milled, it's not because milled glass ceramics uh, aren't ready for the big leagues, as I've heard uh, a famous prosthodontist say once, but because it's infinitely cheaper for your lab to manufacture glass ceramic uh, with, the, with the pressing method, mostly because if they're milling if 80% of their business is monolithic zirconia, then the last thing they want to do is have to put uh, a block of Emacs into that mill because you, you can only mill blocks for Emacs, for example. And so the last thing they want to do is take a, a mill that could be milling 20 units out of a puck and put in a block that's only milling one unit, right? That, that doesn't make any sense. Plus with an ingot of uh, Emacs, for example, they could probably get two to five restorations out of that ingot, depending on how big the ingot is and what they're pressing. Where meanwhile, if they're milling it, hey, they're just going to get one. So, so laboratories are making economical decisions, not not quality of outcome decisions when they uh, either print and press or wax and press Emacs, but but also uh, they're pushing you as a provider to aesthetic zirconia, not because aesthetic zirconia is uh, better than Emacs. So they have the same fracture toughness. They're gonna to perform the same clinically. Uh, but the, the reason that they're pushing you to that is because from a, a workflow perspective, if you ask for aesthetic zirconia instead of say uh, the good old strong unbreakable stuff, the only difference in their workflow is that they put in uh, an aesthetic zirconia puck instead of a, a three white puck. But anyway, that, that goes beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight. Uh, but even gold crowns today can be milled as good or better than castings. I never really thought that we'd get there, but uh, there's several labs. Uh, this particular study was done in conjunction with strategy milling uh, up in Pennsylvania who do a, a fabulous job. And if you wanted to milled gold crown, I think, easygoldcrowns.com uses strategy milling and and um, it, it's really amazing that we can get something that is economical out of a mill with gold. They use uh, Ivoclar alloys and fabulous results. I never thought we'd have a milled gold crown that would fit as good or better as a casting, but uh, welcome to 2022. And to speak of laboratories, you know, one of the knocks on old, say, church side CAD cam restorations and other things was that 
because they were monolithic, that they were not as aesthetic as what the laboratory did with stacked restorations and these sorts of things. Well, guess what? Today, laboratories are doing monolithic restorations, right? So all of these restorations, these happen to be courtesy of Bob Clark out of Williams Dental Laboratory. And we've got implants next to veneers. We've got veneer cases, crowns next to veneers. In all of these situations, now the lab has gone to monolithic restorations with surface texture staining glaze to get what they need because We've got glass ceramics today that are so aesthetic that we no longer need to compensate by layering those ceramics. And meanwhile, the monolithic ceramics provide us a lot of um, advantages with respect to durability and fracture resistance because we're not putting in potential areas that are gonna fracture, right? And everything else that we're doing is milled. So your implant restorative is milled, whether we're talking about full arch uh, monolithic zirconia, whether we're talking about uh, that titanium bar with whatever's going over the top, whether we're talking about single unit, hey, all of these things are being milled. Dentures now, hey, we're milling dentures. This is, uh, milling technology is, is no longer a, a niche technology. This is a pervasive technology in that everything we're doing today is milled. So, you know, when it comes to the point where you're trying to decide, okay, but do I need to own a mill or not? Uh, I've already told you how yeah, I think it's a no brainer to invest in a scanner, but do you need to add a mill? Well, I'd say the real deciding factor here is do you know what you want to make? You need to know what your practice does. And you need to know what your practice wants to do. Sometimes that's hard to know. But once you know those things, then, then the deciding factor really is made for you. Now, when we talk about approaches um, in analyzing cost-benefit ratio, where, where we say, okay, well, we're either going to... Um, invest in technology and uh, thanks to this technology, we're gonna be able to add new procedures to our offerings. Well, in that typical scenario, you do a return on investment calculation, right? And meanwhile, if it's already facilitating what you do, in other words, for most of us doing an onlay or a crown, that sort of thing is, uh, a thing that we do on a daily basis. So you're probably looking at more of a break-even analysis to look at this. And, and beyond that, the great thing for you, unlike when I got into buying scanners and mills and these things, is that we have pretty well-established metrics now for uh, these types of things, whether it be a return on investment or break-even analysis. And, and your Henry Scheinrep has access to these tools where they can actually take your numbers, your numbers from your practice, not mine, right? But take your numbers, look at your practice and plug some of these in to really know how this really fits your practice. And that's that's pretty great. But, but dentistry sort of gets a little more complicated, right? Because as we as practitioners acquire new skills and as, as there are new developments in dentistry, this drives the need for new toys. And as a business owner, the need for new toys can get expensive and problematic, right? So, so you're always trying to, to, at least I'm always trying to minimize my need for new toys by being sure that when I buy a toy, hey, it's going to suit not only my current needs, but maybe my, what my future needs might be too. And milling is getting more interesting now because we have several manufacturers now that it, either within the same manufacturer or across different manufacturers. We have mills now that are geared towards different things, right? Whether we're talking about chair side mills, which uh, for example, that, that one on the left uh, from Playmac is chair side mill versus their, their laboratory mill that's, that's geared towards milling pucks. So there's, there are more and more decisions to be made. So let's talk about chair side CAD CAM first. Uh, because this is easy. Hey, chair side CAD CAM, which has been around now a while, 
really does several things for you in that when we start talking about having single visit dentistry instead of multiple visit dentistry, hey, it's all about creating cash flow. So not only does it eliminate material and operational cost, but and your your office manager loves it because you don't have to check to see whether insurance pays on on prep date or seat date. It's irrelevant because hey, it's already done. So we collect, right? That's great. So cash flow is great. And the fact that you can take uh, a situation, uh, say a same day emergency treatment and not have that patient come back translates into having more visits in the future for more production time and, and higher cash flow potential, which if you're a guy like me who doesn't have any partners or any help, hey, the, the only possibility I have for generating income to pay my staff and to pay my mortgage is through my cheer time. So the more cheer time I can have, the better. Because when you start eliminating visits, you eliminate uh, several things, but you create more production time. I won't go really into detail, but if you've ever, and if you really want a good day or two on this, you should see a guy like, say, Chris Salerno, uh, who does a great job of, of doing a lot of business stuff for practice. But, you know, Chris would talk about gross profit margin. And if you haven't seen this type of breakdown before, this isn't something you'd necessarily do for everything in your practice, but for a few things in your practice, you can break it down to where you actually know exactly what it costs you to do a procedure. Um, and in this scenario, we're taking into account not doctor labor, but just direct labor for an assistant, that sort of thing. If you have associates or different structures, you might take into account that doctor labor. But for a guy like me, we don't do that. So this is just comparing, say, a single visit and my cost associated with that versus a two visit uh, type of setup uh, with the laboratory cost, et cetera. Now, I don't know what you're paying for crowns. So uh, you plug and play your own numbers in here. This is a great thing for you to do for, for not everything you do in your office, but definitely the, the things that you do most often. And if we look at, for example, and these are just numbers, uh, if you go to fairhealthconsumer.org, it's a pretty cool website. You can look up uh, numbers. I just randomly pick some out for a zip code that, uh, I think it's San Diego, mostly just because I love visiting San Diego. Uh, and so you can see what typical revenue is for four surface onlay in a PPO or a crown, and then fee for service, uh, four surface onlay in a crown. And if you'll notice, you, you know, you're looking at your revenue and your cost and, and you get your gross profit margin. You can see that, that we have very high gross profit margins across the board. Uh, anything if your overhead's sitting at 65, 70%, hey, if your gross profit margin is over 90%, you're doing really well. Uh, if you look at two visits with the lab, and I even knocked 30 bucks off of that lab case to where uh, I think this is set at about 70 bucks for your lab fee. But you can see that by having uh, a mill in your office and doing single visit CAD CAM dentistry, you're improving your gross profit margin by close to 10%. And interestingly, you know, a lot of times when docs are in PPO practices like mine, they're concerned about the cost of investing in technology. But the flip side of that is that you actually get a better, uh, a much better gross profit margin by having that technology in house. So, so especially if you're a guy like me that takes PPOs, you're going to, have uh, you're actually protecting your business by having that investment in technology. Uh, and if we look at monolithic zirconia, hey, then we've got uh, everything. And I, I've got it here, whether you've got a mill in-house, but you're taking two visits versus uh, a single visit. And so that, that's geared more towards hey, the, the chair side mill is, is actually has the, the best growth, gross profit margin of, of any of those. Even though if you look at the expense of milling out a single unit from a block, say with the chairside mill in my look, zirconia uh, is more expensive than milling multiple units out of a puck. But because of that second visit, your gross profit margin is still better. And that's where there's really a leverage with uh, fewer visits in your practice, right? And 
contrary to proper belief, hey, implementing manufacturing or scanning and manufacturing into your practice, uh, you know, if we're talking about CBCT, hey, you don't have to become a radiologist. You can send those out now really easily to get read, right? If you're adding a, a scanner in a mill, this doesn't turn you into a lab technician or necessarily change your work clothes, your materials, or your preparation styles, right? This is not 2005, right? You have access to all the materials you want. Uh, the workflows are easy. We're not managing materials that require as much uh, touch and fuss as they used to. And these are things that now can be managed for the, for the majority of what most practices do on a daily basis. You can manage it. I mean, we even have a, a publications showing you how to paint by number, right? Uh, colors is just about contrast and depth. Uh, you get the value right, surface texture, a little color. Hey, this is this is not uh, rocket science anymore. That's not to say that you won't use uh, uh, somebody at some point to help you with certain cases, but the bread and butter practice can do the vast majority that they want. Even uh, hand polished glass ceramics turn out really great, right? So uh, this this case is just a, a hand polished omelet that you sold earlier. So why would you choose uh, a lab mill? Well, hey, this is when if you really want, if if you have uh, a lot of locations or you get a high volume monolithic zirconia, maybe it would make sense to you. And definitely if you're looking to manufacture things that a chair side mill can't, right? Chair side mills don't mill dentures. They don't mill bite splints. They don't mill for large hybrids. They don't mill anything longer than say a four or five you know, if you've got a canine to canine lower uh, FPD, maybe it can mill it. But otherwise, hey, you, you're going to need something else if you want to mill that. And if that's something you want to mill, then choosing a lab mill would be would be right. Uh, I would tell you that you have to be careful, though, when you're looking at return on investment, because, I mean, th these return on investment calculators and break-even analyses and, and all of these metrics that that your uh, Henry Shine rep or, or whatever manufacturer you choose to work with uh, can provide you are, are really cool uh, and, and easy to use. But I, I think you need to be careful because I think they largely underestimate uh, the impact it has on your practice. One, because your patients uh, don't want the conventional experience anymore. They want conventional to be the digital experience, right? Patients love the digital experience, and I always say that, that the only thing that a patient, even though I've got a great rapport with a lot of my patients, uh, the only thing they want to do is see me twice, right? And the more times they come back, the more times we have an opportunity to have an interaction with a patient that's uncomfortable or inconvenient or not great, and a patient that's been a patient for years might all of a sudden... Um, get sideways, right? We know that it doesn't take much when it comes to negative experiences to get a patient thinking about going somewhere else. And so for me, the fewer times I have to see that patient uh, and have the opportunity to screw up, the better, right? And while my older patients are impressed by the technology, hey, my younger patients now expect the technology and if you're worried about that investment, hey, at the end of the day, we all know that investing in technology takes uh, money and that you're going to have to redo it over time. We do it with our cell phones. We do it with everything else. But the honest truth is that digital workflows are becoming, uh, as you can see, more cost effective than conventional ones already. That's true whether you're a dental laboratory or whether you're a clinician. One of your best tools for fighting declining reimbursements and commoditization of our practices, or at least of our profession today, is to invest in that technology so that you can manage patient expectations, better manage patient solutions, and take more control over what happens and do it more efficiently and in fewer visits. And the future of interdisciplinary dentistry is obviously in um, the realm of digital dentistry. And that leads me to my 
final change that I think has been perhaps the biggest, and that's evolution of software. So now we're integrating our diagnostic data, uh, our treatment planning, even facilitating that treatment delivery and the solution fabrication, all with under the all under the um, umbrella of digital treatment and technology, but that's primarily driven through software, right? So we've gone from digital dentistry, meaning, well, I can do a crown or an omelet in the same visit. And now we're expanding that out into a whole plethora of things that really covers the scope of what we as practitioners do today, whether you're the one doing it or whether you're interacting with somebody else that's helping you to do it, right? Everything from TMJ and airway, smile design, placing implants, restoring implants, working with orthodontists. Hey, everything is going digital, right? So my orthodontists are already working digitally. And so before when I, you know, back in the day, these uh, 12 year olds and their parents weren't very, um, you know, you could stick a Holly retainer on some teeth and say, see you when you're 20 and life was good, right? I find that my patients don't accept that today, or at least their pay, their parents don't accept it. So so the problem before, if we we're going to do, say, a resin bonded uh, fixed partial denture in this area to hold this patient till they're old enough for implants or whatever you'd like to do, hey, before brackets and wires would have to come off, and then we'd be waiting two weeks for things to get back. And these days, we can remove those brackets digitally, uh, go ahead and design the restorations before the patient comes out of braces. And then this patient only has to be without teeth for the amount of time it takes them to drive from my specialist office to mine, right? Uh, and this is, a, is a, just a huge leverage of digital technology, and we can do it because my specialist is scanning things in. Uh, I can receive that data and do what I want with it and everything works seamlessly. Or say a patient like this who comes in, she has to have these crowns off today, right? They're driving her nuts, even though she's had them for 40 years. I'm concerned about her lower occlusion. And so what we're gonna do is mock up uh, where my orthodontist is gonna get her digitally before we ever start so that I can plan her occlusion in her case uh, she wanted to keep an asymmetric smile, but wanted to get rid of the old ceramics and, and black lines and these things. And so we did some planning, did a mock-up, tried it in her mouth, got her happy with it uh, to where she wanted it to look like uh, the mock-up that we tried in her mouth. And we were able to take her, um, after we started a little bit of movement on the top, uh, we went and cut everything off and and finished uh, the top. And then uh, that was great. And I could plan the top and deliver it knowing that I accommodated the bottom occlusion because we already had that model. So then uh, afterwards, eventually she got her orthodontics done, but not before we finished the top, right? With, with digital implant workflows, hey, there, there are no good reasons to do analog implant workflows anymore, uh, mostly because all of your solutions for implants today are digitally driven and fabricated. By starting digital, you're eliminating crossover errors. Uh, they're more cost-effective, they're more time uh, efficient. I'm not saying you're not getting great results if you're doing physical impressions with implants, but hey, we've got tons of data now showing that uh, outcomes with digital are as good or better than conventional. Patients and practitioners like it better, and it really doesn't matter what you like to provide your patients, uh, whether we're talking about a custom abutment, whether we're talking about cemented restorations, whether we're talking about screw retained, whether we're talking about a tie base, whether we're talking about uh, this one poor guy has a prefabricated abutment, uh, a matching uh, connection, uh, custom abutment crown and a, and a platform switch, custom abutment crown all on one side. Hey, I'm not suggesting you do that, but anything is possible right now with these. And, and digital is just better. It gives you full control, whether you want to do it in a single visit or whether you want to do it over multiple visits, whether you want to do it, make your final impression at the time of surgery, because now hey, you're planning these surgeries 
And, and the cool thing is now, hey, you can plan that surgery uh, and you can put that implant right where you planned it, right? With a uh, custom sulcus former, if you're into that kind of thing, you want to develop that site and you can do all of your planning and execution and know everything's going to turn out uh, exactly the way that you planned it and, and get exactly what you want, right? And you can do that in, in few visits. And then, you know, when you get into big trauma cases, which we're, we're sort of running out of time, but I want to open up to questions. But when you get to a case like Jenna's, who comes in and her teeth are flapping in the breeze due to trauma and some other things, uh, this is a complicated case that, hey, through digital technology and working with my orthodontist, my oral surgeon, and me on the restorative end, hey, we're, we're planning this case digitally. Uh, ironically, we started this with, with clear liner therapy uh, to get things back in her face where she liked it. Then teeth came out. She got a big old graft off of her chin. We already knew um, where we wanted teeth because we based that off of initially where her teeth were. And once we got the implants placed and we knew the implants were gonna be placed in a good position, we knew we were gonna have a soft tissue deficit because we already uh, saw that from the get go. Uh, she was wearing a snap on smile through the interim transition and was able to use that then to tell us she wanted it shorter. So. So once we tried that, uh, put that data back into the software, hey, we, we can do final treatment planning here for where we want things to end up. And we can get this patient uh, what she wants, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're shooting for. In this case, we did a cobalt chrome framework, uh, painted some ceramic over the top, did individual Emacs restorations. And everything in this case was done digitally, except obviously when the ceramic was painted onto that framework, we had to redigitize that. Everything else was digital. And at the end of the day, the patient was thrilled. And, you know, uh, this is the new post-op photo, right? It's the patient selfie because hey, she was tickled. She got her smile back. And really for me, the biggest uh, and most important part about the digitization of my practice is that I've never been able to provide results for patients and know that those results are going to be exactly what they want uh, in such a way as I can now today, thanks to leveraging digital technologies, uh, not only through that data acquisition, but all the way through treatment planning, uh, treatment execution, and, and manufacturing, whether I'm the one manufacturing or not. Uh, thanks for joining me this evening, and uh, I know it's uh, probably been a long day, and I really appreciate your time uh, because I, I know how tough it is at the end of the day to uh, to sit down to a webinar. So hopefully, I at least kept you awake. I'd love to open the floor up to some questions, and um, and see uh, if anybody wants to wants to chat. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in. The first question okay. is, what was the driving factor that influenced you to get started with CAD-CAM dentistry? Oh, well, that, that was definitely at the beginning of my presentation, which is that uh, the, the ability to do more conservative treatment for my patients with, with partial coverage class ceramics was, was huge, right? Because any, anybody that's ever tried to do, say, a, a four surface onlay on a patient and provisionalize that and then send them away for a couple of weeks and get back and have everything uh, working out is, is tough, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of obstacles there. Uh, sometimes there's problems with sensitivity. You have problems trying to retain that provisional. Hey, with, with single visit chair side CAD cam, None of those factors are an issue. So I really loved that helping me uh, to, to be able to provide that for my patient that otherwise is, is undeniably pretty challenging. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have another question coming in. 
and from Peggy. And Peggy wanted to know, how long does it take you from start to finish for a single visit crown? Do you delegate a lot to your assistant? Well, uh, Peggy, as I mentioned, I don't do a lot of crowns. I do a lot of onlays. But uh, at the end of the day, it's pretty much the same uh, in that uh, that's sort of like asking how long a root canal takes. We all know that, that certain teeth are more problematic than others. Uh, we, and hey, I'm not the fastest guy cheerside, but I would tell you that typically for glass ceramic restoration in my practice, uh, that patient's typically in the chair about an hour and a half, uh, which, which is similar for me when I was using a conventional workflow. Uh, if we're doing monolithic zirconia because it takes a little more time in the centering oven, then, then, then that's probably getting closer to two hours, uh, though, though things are getting shorter and shorter as technology is getting faster and better, right? But uh, yeah, hour and a half or so, how much is delegated? Well, everybody in my office, I run a, a pretty small uh, outfit, so everybody in my office is cross-trained to do things. Uh, whether that's design, whether that's managing the restoration out of the mill, whether that's getting the restoration ready to bond in place. And uh, sometimes I delegate pretty much all of that workflow other than I do love to scan in my preparation because I always see things I want to change. Other than that, uh, what I delegate just sort of depends on what's in the chair next to me. You know, the, the system that I'm using, it, it makes uh, delegation uh, really easy. The workflows are, are uh, really something that you can teach an auxiliary to do. And so when, when you have uh, good staff members, you can absolutely train them to do a majority of those things, anything from design to characterization and, and having that restoration ready to go in. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, we have a question from Robert, and he really enjoyed the presentation. He was specifically asking about the graph about trueness with the different scanners relative to each other and to PVS. He wanted yeah. to know, are those differences relevant for single, multiple, full arch restorations? Yeah, so, so that data uh, specifically spoke to cross arch uh, trueness. Uh, if we're talking about a single unit, uh let's say you have a quadrant that you're scanning in uh, does that that well first of all you know on on that graphic you saw that there's there's probably uh anywhere from four to half a dozen scanners on the market today and that 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 is already out of date right we, we've got several scanners that even if you're taking uh full arch impressions that you can get a a, a really nice result that meets or exceeds pbs when we talk about quadrant dentistry, man, we've had scanners, uh, old scanners on the market for a long time that for quadrant dentistry do a great job uh, that aren't as technologically advanced as what we have on the market today. So uh, the the, pro the only problem is, is that is, is some of these new scanners, you see a lot of companies popping up these days. Hey, some of these companies coming out of nowhere that don't have better technology, you'd probably want to be a little careful uh, even with quadrant stuff until you know it's good. All of the main players there today, if you're talking about making a quadrant scan for restoration, it's probably irrelevant as to which one you're, you're using. Uh, all of them should be able to get you a nice quadrant scan for a single restoration. That's not going to affect the final outcome of the restoration. Thank you, doctor. We had a request for your social media if possible. Oh man, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hate social media. Well, I'm sorry, that's not true. I, I don't hate social media, but uh, uh, I, I don't put a ton of um, of things on uh, social media. But but I am on Instagram, uh, and and uh, hold on, I'm going to have to look up my handle though because this is how how socially uh, thing. Uh, Clint DDS, C L I N T DDS on Instagram. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me. Though I, I probably post more uh, things about uh, personal stuff than I do dental. Uh, I do a lot of lurking on dental uh, stuff, but 
but uh, really try to stay off of social media. But I'm always happy to connect with folks on social media. Uh, feel free to find me. And again, uh, happy for you to have my email as well. Thank you, Doctor. And I think we have two final questions coming in. The first one was, where did you get your team trained to do the dental technician work like staining, glazing, et cetera? Oh, well, you know, there are a lot of resources uh, out there and, and depending on what manufacturer you go with, uh, there are, are plenty of opportunities there. Uh, most recently, I sent my assistant to the Mod Institute out in South Carolina and uh, really upped our game quite a bit um, with, with several of our new, new team members. So I recommend the Mod uh, for sure. Um, but there's there's plenty of resources out there uh, to look around, and and I'm sure your your shine rep can help point you in the right direction for sure. Thank you, doctor. And I think this might be our last question, and that was, do you find scanning improved uh, improve the quality of your preps? Oh heck yeah, man! Uh, I mean, the the first time you see your your own prep. Uh, scanned in and big on the on the big screen it's pretty humbling uh, and I, I would say that uh, well as I mentioned I, I prefer to scan in my preparation myself uh, of course depending on where you live that might be the law anyway but uh, I love seeing my prep because I would say even today uh, at least 75% of the time I'm picking my handpiece up and fixing something, you know? So there's just, there are just certain things that, man, until you get it scanned in and you can see it in 3D and rotate it, see it with the posing and, and sometimes even with the proposed restoration in place, you just really can't see it that well until you do that. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm nitpicking my stuff all the time. And, and I absolutely think that uh, no matter who it is that you can improve the quality of your preparation just by, getting the scanner so that you can you can see what you're doing better thank you dr stevens uh, for the excellent presentation as well as answering everyone's questions everyone attending tonight will receive the recording of tonight's webinar via email in the next week if anyone is interested in attending future webinars please visit www.henryshinedental.com slash webinars thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Thanks.